Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Tanya Winders, the President and CEO of Allergy and Asthma Network, and it's my pleasure to welcome you today to our 20th webinar in our series of special presentations from our typical webinar series that are dedicated to addressing the unique issues related to coronavirus. At Allergy and Asthma Network, we've been dedicated to ending the needless death and suffering due to allergies, asthma, and related conditions like COVID-19 since 1985. We do that through our four mission areas of outreach, education, advocacy, and research. As you all know, there's been a lot of concern about allergies and life-threatening allergic reactions due to the COVID-19 vaccine. We're here today with national experts to share the latest science with you. So I'd like to introduce these speakers to you today. First, Dr. Jackie aguari Sabet. She is a board certified allergy immunology and pediatric specialist who is the director of telehealth for Allergy and Asthma Network. She's the founder of Family Allergy and Asthma Care, where she has been in private practice treating children and adults since 1994 in the Metro DC area. She is the president of White Coat Resources, a health education consulting service that helps connect patients to therapy through innovative medical messaging and educational programs. She is also, as you can see, a clinical assistant professor of medicine at George Washington School of Medicine. Next, Dr. Purvi Parikh is an adult and pediatric allergist immunologist at Allergy and Asthma Associates of Murray Hill. She currently serves on faculty as clinical assistant professor in both departments of medicine and pediatrics at NYU School of Medicine. She is the national spokesperson for Allergy and Asthma Network and frequently appears on CNN, Wall Street Journal, and CBS, as well as other major news affiliates on our behalf. Thank you both for joining me today. So here's an outline of how we will spend the balance of our time together. First, we'll take a look at the current state of COVID as we always do, check out the statistics and the numbers, see how things are trending. Second, we'll turn to a vaccine overview that'll be provided by Dr. Freak. And then we'll dive into the discussion around identification and management of anaphylaxis and the concern around allergic reactions due to the vaccine led by Dr. Rigari Sabet. And then finally, we'll wrap up with an overview of some of the valuable allergy and asthma network resources that have been developed to support you in your journey throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. So as we get started, uh, we're going to take a look again at the current state of COVID-19 and what are the statistics as we round the corner to the final 10 days of January 2021. We always like to go to the Johns Hopkins global map. And as of today, around noontime, you can see that the global case rate is inching ever so closely to 100 million documented cases. Um, again, we know that there may be additional probable cases that are higher than this, but these are those documented global cases throughout the world. And you can see that in the United States, we now have surpassed the 24 million case uh, milestone. And this is also a useful resource in tracking global deaths. Unfortunately, we have exceeded that 2 million uh, global death toll due to COVID-19 and the 400,000 mark in the US. Uh, so again, we, we encourage you to visit this Johns Hopkins dashboard and the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Center for the most accurate up-to-date statistics on the impact of COVID-19. We also rely heavily on the CDC's uh, daily case reporting and looking at the trends over time, looking at where in the country we're seeing those average daily case rates uh, the highest. And as you can see, we have had some activity um, in, in various regions of the country where we are at those high rates of 97.8 to 134.7 cases per 100,000 in the last seven days. And so that's the very darkest blue. Uh, again, the CDC data on total cases and on total death rate do seem to lag uh, the, the Johns Hopkins data just a bit due to the way in which they report this. This was as of today at 9 a.m. 
But nonetheless, you can see how this is trended over time throughout the winter months of October, November, December, and January. When we turn our focus to the headlines, again, this is a very monumental, important day in the American history with uh, our 46th president, uh, Joe Biden, taking office. And so when we look at the headlines relative to COVID, we've seen, again, a strong emphasis coming out of the Biden administration about their particular approach to the COVID-19 pandemic. They have certainly, uh, come out very strongly with a task force dedicated to the pandemic. And Biden himself has said that, in fact, the pandemic, certainly the, the pandemic travel restrictions won't end anytime soon, but he does plan to strengthen our public health measures around international travel and has a full task force dedicated to the pandemic and also to other important issues like health equity. We've also seen at least 20 states that are now reporting new cases of a more contagious COVID variant than, than was first found overseas. Um, there actually tends, it seems to be more than one variant. And so we may hear more about that from Dr. Parikh and Dr. Agari as we go along today. But this new form um, that was found in, or identified in California is being called, quote unquote, the California variant. And then we've also seen reports that residents and staff in long-term care facilities are actually starting to get their second dose of vaccine. Um, I know in, in my own community, we're seeing a lot of frontline healthcare workers also receive that second dose of the vaccine and reach that full immunity that is anticipated from use of the vaccine. So that's great news as we turn the corner. We all have been concerned about some of the statistics around the uh, vaccine distribution or, or dissemination and administration. And I'm sure that we'll talk a bit more about that as we go throughout the day. But the good news is we have seen that new cases across the country have been trending downward since hitting our, our peak last week. But the important thing here is we can't let our guard down. We are certainly not beyond the pandemic yet. And the data from the CDC, CDC still shows a significant gap in the number of COVID-19 vaccines that have actually been distributed to states versus those that have actually been administered into arms. So we know there are a lot of reasons for this. Uh, there's been confusion um, in, in the public about who gets the vaccine, when they get it, how to get it. Um, certainly some of our public health departments, unfortunately, have not had the infrastructure to support the administration and distribution of the vaccines. And some states have actually complained that the federal government isn't sending enough vaccines or, or that sending the vaccines fast enough. And so, again, we know that there is this um, challenge of getting an entire nation vaccinated in a timely way so that we can reach that herd immunity. These are the case rates over time uh, and reported by day. And again, you can see these in two week increments since the beginning of the pandemic and since we began bringing these webinars to you back in early March. And again, it looks as if that over the last two weeks, we are beginning to see that decline in daily case rates. And uh, uh, again, we've now fallen below the even 150,000 new cases per day mark in just the most recent report. So now let's uh, take our first poll question. You guys know we like to make these uh, webinars interactive. So our first poll question for today has to do with, are the COVID-19 virus numbers in your area going up, staying down, or staying the same? So I will go ahead and launch the poll. We'll ask you all to respond quickly with yes, no, or I don't know. Are COVID-19 virus numbers in your area going up, staying the same or going down. We do have about 2,000 people registered for this afternoon's webinar, so we appreciate everyone joining us and logging in your response. We'll continue to collect this and uh, share this data over time because we're learning a lot from your input. So with the Response of yes, that's saying that your numbers are going up. Um, with the response of no, that means your numbers are going down. And then the I don't know, I guess, staying the same. We should have done the responses a little bit differently, I think, on this. But this is 
we'll hopefully get accurate responses here. So it looks like we've got most of your responses in. I'll go ahead and close the poll and share the results. So set, about 70% of you say that your numbers are still going up in your area, and then 17% say they're going down, um, and 13% are not sure. And, and again, I think that it's very dependent on where you live and what you're seeing in your local community as to the way in which um, you know, communities are responding, uh, but we do highly encourage that we all continue to take those strides that are so recommended by the three W's of wearing a mask, watching our social distancing, and washing our hands consistently. So now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Parikh, and she's going to provide us with the vaccine overview. All right, thank you very much. So basically, to date, um, we've had about 31 million doses uh, distributed and about 15 million of those, a little more than 15 million, ad administered. Um, so the number of people receiving one or more doses is comparable, you know, close to 14 million. And there's 2 million um, who've already received both doses. Um, I'm happy to say that I, I am in that 2 million, <laughs> and I hope that number grows more as time goes on. Next slide. So are vaccines effective? The short answer is yes. Um, vaccines save lives. Uh, scientists you know, widely consider immunization to be one of the greatest public health achievements of the 20th century. Um, the flu vaccine reduces the risk of flu illness by about uh, 40 to 60 percent among the overall population. And of course, deaths and hospitalizations that are associated with flu. Um, and then two doses of the inactivated polio vaccine are 90% effective or more against polio. Um, three are 99 to 100% effective. And this is huge. Um, I don't know if you've seen any polio survivors, but um, you know it is a very debilitating disease that can cause lifelong uh, paralysis. And as an immunologist throughout this entire pandemic, I constantly get asked for an immune booster and really, there's no easy fix, but the only most efficient immune booster we have are vaccines. So it's ironic that they've become controversial, but this is the single most effective way to boost your immune system in the shortest amount of time uh, is with a vaccine. So in just an overview of the coronavirus tracker, the vaccine tracker, um, we have you know one that unfortunately was abandoned. Um, for, that was in trials in Australia, two are currently approved for emergency use. Um, and we have, you know, multiple that are in various phases of study. So 41 that are still in phase one, 22 in phase two, and 20 in phase three. And these studies are still very crucial because as vaccine supply dwindles, it will be good to have more options uh, and for, um, you know, diverse populations. So the types of COVID-19 vaccines, so kind of the two front runner technologies in the US are either mRNA uh, vaccines or vector-based vaccines. So the two that are currently approved, Pfizer and Moderna are mRNA vaccines. And what that is, is they're synthetically produced RNA fragments of the virus that are used to give um, the body instructions that enable it to make um, a protein that mimics the spike of the coronavirus. Um, and this is recognized by the immune system, which then reacts and produces antibodies and T cells. Um, and that way, if the real coronavirus appears, the defense system is equipped and can prevent this infection. And one of the best analogies I've heard for this is, you know, the, it's like a Snapchat message, you know, it gives your immune system a message and then it disappears, uh, or a recipe or a cheat code if you like video games. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really interesting. And I really think this is going to be kind of the vaccine of the future because it doesn't contain any virus at all, dead or alive, and it's easy um, to produce uh, fairly quickly in, in times of public health crises. Um, vector vaccines are the other front runner, that's AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson's technology. And what this is, is it consists of a genetically modified um, common cold virus, a chimpanzee virus, which is uh, acts as a vehicle to carry genetic material from SARS CoV-2 into human cells as a vector. Uh, and this is the same concept that we've used in the e Ebola vaccine as well. Next slide. 
So kind of going through Moderna's overview, you know, this is the first um, to fix formulation. It's an mRNA vaccine. It's two doses, which is important to know, four weeks apart. And you really do need both doses to have that sustaining immunity. But once you get them, um, it's about 94.5% effective um, two weeks after that second dose. Um, we found that it's slightly more effective in younger groups uh, than in elderly. Um, and it can cause some more side effects, but many are very short-lived, such as pain in the injection site, flu-like symptoms. Most, again, uh, subside within 24 to 48 hours. This can be stored in a normal um, uh, fridge or freezer, and so it's much easier to use for non-hospital settings. And you know, the FDA has a great fact sheet um, from you know around the time of their hearing for everybody to access on a lot of detailed information about this vaccine. So, Bio, BioNTech and Pfizer was actually the first to clear approval. Um, it's already you know used on a massive scale. Uh, also, an mRNA vaccine. This is also two doses, slightly different in, in the fact that it's three weeks apart instead of four. Um, also 95% effective and has proven to give good protection in the older population as well. Um, again, the side effects are limited, but they're very similar to the Moderna vaccine. Uh, and the pain, flu-like symptoms, again, one to two days. This one though, unfortunately has to be um, shipped and stored at negative 70 degrees. So it's really only meant for you know large facilities that have this type of a freezer. Um, and at normal refrigerator temperatures, it, you have to use it within five days. Otherwise, it's not uh, good. And the FDA fact sheet is there too. So it's really good that both of these vaccine candidates have very similar results. So that just goes to show in, in medicine, we like to see the same thing be reproduced over and over again, because that tells us it's accurate. So it's a good sign that both Moderna and Pfizer are so similar. Um, AstraZeneca uh, is likely going to be approved in the next couple of months. Um, this is one of the vector vaccines, so it's a little bit different than Moderna and Pfizer. Uh, it can be produced in large quantities and doesn't require special cooling. Um, and it's very beneficial to certain areas of the world, you know, that where these cold chain issues occur, you know, and also it's cheaper to produce. So another reason too, certain areas of the world that needs billions of doses, it can be more helpful. Um, so this one, the efficacy story is a little confusing and I'm looking to see more data as it comes out. But initially it actually looked at like that it was 70% effective when um, it had the same dose uh, given a month apart. But the AstraZeneca leadership is saying that actually can reach 90% efficacy when a half dose is administered followed by a full dose. So again, um, the data needs to be released so we can you know, make sense of it all. So stay tuned for that. Um, this is also two doses, one month apart. Um, again, no serious side effects, um, but I, being an investigator on this trial as well as Pfizer, I can report that at least what we've been seeing is that there's very similar side effects to the Pfizer and Moderna trials with flu-like symptoms, injection site pain. Um, and you know, it's already approved in the UK. Um, with a booster at three months. So uh, this, the F FDA fact sheet will come when it's closer to its uh, emergency approval date. Um, and then just briefly touching on what else is going on around the world. Um, you know, Russia made headlines with uh, kind of their first approval of their Sputnik vaccine. This was also controversial because they approved it even before it had hit phase three and there's concerns about some transparency, but you know, they do boast 95% effectiveness this also often requires multiple doses. This one is more similar to the AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson vaccines. And there was um, some information published in The Lancet about this vaccine. Next slide. And China is using the Sinopharm vaccine. This one, uh, you know, it's a classical method. There's no genetic engineering of, you know, using a inactivated or killed virus similar to what we use with the flu. Uh, this one is 79% effective in trials, but again, there's a lot of uh, international confidence that's lacking in the Chinese vaccine due to lack of transparency um, because few test results have been published, and this is currently approved in China and the UAE. And then finally, Johnson & Johnson. This one, uh, if you've been paying attention to the news, has been getting a lot of buzz. 
uh, this week and last week. Um, it's not yet approved, but it's expected to be uh, one of the ones approved very soon. It is a viral vector vaccine similar to AstraZeneca, but the study actually was very promising. It actually showed it was 97% effective. Um, and it was studied as both single and two dose vaccines, but actually it looks like it's going to be just a single dose shot, which is great because they found that, uh, you know, from early studies, all, nearly 100% of their participants had full immunity um, 60 days after just one shot. So if this does prove uh, to be reproduced across their phase three, it'll be very exciting because we'll have another vaccine candidate that's only one shot. And this one also doesn't have to be kept very cold. It can be kept in a normal refrigerator. So it'll be great to have another option to help speed up the vaccine rollout. So again, this is a great slide that kind of compares all the different vaccine types um, and whether they require one dose or two doses and how far apart. Also, it gives you an idea of how soon you can have antibody detection. You know, and as you can see, for none of them, it's immediate. And for most, it's at least one to two days after the second shot that you're really protected. So that point is really important. You can't let your guard down after the first shot. Even after the second shot, you still have to continue to be careful because it takes time for that immunity to boost. Um, you have to keep wearing your mask, keep social distancing. Um, I know many people who've gotten sick between the two doses because the immunity hasn't built up yet. So again, just keep that in mind. Um, and this is not a, a passport to stop using your mask or social distancing. Next slide. Um, okay, so, you know, how do some of the vaccines compare across the world globally? Uh, this is a wonderful slide kind of going through what we just uh, discussed. Uh, this slide also inclu includes the cost, which is a very important thing, obviously, that we always forget. As you can see, AstraZeneca is by far the cheapest out of all of them, um, which will be very beneficial to a lot of the uh, developing world that may not have the monetary resources that um, the U.S. or other larger uh, countries have. <clears throat> Um, so the rollout, you know, so this, you know, there a lot of criticism has occurred uh, regarding the rollout uh, for many reasons. The goal, of course, is that we want to reduce severe outcomes um, and morbidity and mortality. So we want to reduce people getting very sick. We want to reduce them admitted to the hospital or the ICU and, of course, death. Um, and we want to uh, make sure that the, you know, transmission decreases as well. Um, and the criteria uh, is kind of prioritized by risk of acquiring infection, uh, risk of severe morbidity, mortality, um, again, any negative societal impact and, and transmitting infection to others. So there's four phases of allocation that have currently been uh, adopted. So phase one kind of has, um, you know, the really high risk groups such as healthcare workers, people uh, of a certain age group, you know, above a certain age group that are higher risk, elderly. Uh, people with certain high-risk medical conditions that put them at high risk for severe COVID. Phase two are um, the other professions that, you know, are in uh, interacting on a daily basis um, in a high-risk environment. So that includes uh, teachers, critical workers in high-risk settings. Again, people of all ages now are now included with those comorbid conditions. Um, people in homeless shelters, uh, prisons, and then all older adults that weren't in phase one. Um, and then phase three is young adults, children, um, workers and in industries and occupations important to functioning of society. And phase four is everyone residing in the US um, you know, who did not already have access to the vaccine in previous uh, phases. And, you know, equity is really important. We want to make sure that, you know, vaccine access should be prioritized for um, all geographic locations uh, through, you know, CDC social vulnerability index, too, because we do know we saw quite a bit of health disparities through this pandemic and even prior. So this, you know, vaccine is landmark in the pandemic response for Americans. Um, great news is it's equally protective across age groups, across uh, racial and ethnic groups. And luckily, the severe systemic events reported were less than 2%. Even though they get a lot of media attention, please remember they are still very rare in the grand scheme of things. 
So the summary of allergic reactions, what many of you probably have on your mind. Um, so this was following the release of the Pfizer vaccine uh, as of January 6th. So there's been 104 cases, um, 21 cases of anaphylaxis after administration of close to 2 million doses. Um, so that's about 10 times the anaphylaxis rate of flu vaccine. Uh, 17 cases occurred in persons with a documented history of allergy excuse me, allergies or allergic reactions. And seven of these had a history of anaphylaxis. Now, again, I would like you to take all of this with a grain of uh, salt because there's still a lot of investigation being done in these cases. Um, many um, in the allergy and immunology community also have doubts that all of these were 100% allergic, you know, because there are a lot of things that occur when a vaccine is administered that mimic allergic reactions, many of which are very, very benign uh, and often get labeled as allergies. So these are all reported cases. So please take that in mind. They have not been proven to be uh, allergies or anaphylaxis by, you know, formal evaluation and testing. So that is why CDC uh, is recommending you to see a board certified allergist if you do have a problem with the first case to determine uh, the first dose, to determine if it's okay to go to phase, uh, dose two and uh, if it truly was an allergic reaction or not. Also currently our guidelines in the US is that there isn't a need to avoid it, avoid the vaccine if you have allergies, it's only if you're allergic to one of the ingredients in the vaccine. And please be sure to go to a medical facility for your shot and be monitored for 30 minutes afterwards. So the allergic symptoms um, after onset of a vaccine is it's usually about, should immediate, you know, median time 13 minutes, but can be up to 150 minutes. Um, most occurred within the first 15 minutes. So that's why we advise waiting that 30. Uh, normally it's about 15 minute wait after the vaccine, but we're advising people with allergies to wait 30. Um, and non-anaphylaxis uh, symptoms are, you know, could be just itching, rash, itchy, scratchy throat, mild respiratory symptoms. Um, so again, very strong safety profiles. Um, there is a lot, obviously public concern and it's being investigated, but again, um, I would not cause this for a reason to be hesitant or to panic. Um, many actually in the clinical trials, there were thousands of patients with food allergies, drug allergies, environmental allergies that all received the vaccine with no problem. Um, even to date, there's millions of Americans who suffer from all sorts of allergies and asthma that have also received the vaccine with no problem. So um, do not be afraid. Um, and all patients, again, like I said, are observed 15 minutes. We recommend allergic patients wait for 30. And, and please do it in a place where people are equipped to treat anaphylaxis. So, you know, vaccine allergies overall are very rare. You're actually more likely to be hit by lightning statistically. Um, and usually it's not an active ingredient in the vaccine. So you're, it's very unlikely you're actually related to uh, allergic to the vaccine, but rather one of the inactive ingredients. So that could be egg protein, gelatin, formaldehyde, dimerosol, neomycin, um, polyethylene glycol or polysorbate, which we think may be the culprit here. We're not, we're not sure 100%. Um, and then current vaccines luckily are not formulated with any food, drug, or latex. So you don't have to worry about that if you suffer from those allergies. And we usually risk stratify patients the same way, you know, we do for many things for allergic patients. If, you know, do you have a history of a severe allergic reaction to an injectable medicine? Do you have a history of a severe allergic reaction to a prior uh, vaccine? Do you have a history of a severe allergic reaction to another allergen, food, venom, or latex? Although this third one really um, isn't part of our now current guidelines, which are evolving regarding the vaccine, because we do know that many food, venom, and latex allergic patients have tolerated it without any problem. And then this question is important. Do you have a history of a severe allergic reaction to polyethylene glycol, polysorbate or uh, polyoxal 35 castor oil containing injectable or vaccine. So this is the ingredient that we're suspicious of because the other ingredients in the vaccine are like sugar, salts, fats. Um, so if you don't know that you're allergic, you likely are not because this is contained in so many things. Uh, it's in Miralax, it's in toothpaste, it's in various medications such as Toradol. So if you've had all the need to worry, about that. Next slide. Oops. Oh no. Sorry. I just lost my 
Uh, slides. Okay. Um, so emergency use authorization for Pfizer and Moderna. Again, don't administer vaccines to individuals with a known history of the severe reaction to any component of that vaccine. Otherwise, you know, you should be good to go. <clears throat> so the management, uh, a lot of this we had already covered, but again, uh, before you go forward with the second dose, if you have a reaction, see a board certified allergist. Um, you know, pre-treatment is not necessarily recommended uh, because it can And uh, allergy testing also is controversial here because it isn't validated or standardized, but some allergists may use it to help with put together the full clinical picture. Um, and vaccines have good efficacy with one dose, but it's really approved based on the two doses. So if it is possible for you to receive the two doses, then it's, it's extremely important. Next slide. Um, okay, sorry. Uh, okay. So again, we need to support patients. Uh, we need the safety issues surrounding these vaccines because the success of this uh, mRNA platform is foundational to the flex flexibility of the COVID-19 response and our response to other viruses with similar vaccines in phase one and two trials. So it's, it's very important that we understand and investigate each thing that comes up as we go. All right, so the next poll question is, Will the concern about allergies keep you from getting the COVID vaccine? We have launched the poll. If you'll go ahead and enter your responses, we'll share them in just a minute. Will the concern about allergies keep you from getting the COVID vaccine? Yes, no, or I'm still undecided. Again, we firmly support individual choice. Uh, we just want to provide you with the latest evidence and science, and we understand that we all have different uh, beliefs. We're from our experts, as well as from the leadership of the network, and we are in support of the vaccine, but we do accept everyone's individual choice. So we'll keep it open for uh, just a moment. And looks like we've got just about three fourths of all the respondents that are here on the line today. So we'll give it just a second and go ahead and close the poll and share the results. Dr. Creek? Yes, yeah, so uh, it looks like great news. Majority of people will not um, keep this from getting the vaccine. So I'm glad to hear that. Um, I know some still are nervous, which I understand, but I encourage you to speak to your allergist or you know your trusted physician and and talk it through for them uh, with them so it may be something that you may change your mind about and I, I of course there's always undecided people and with that i'm gonna hand it over uh, to dr jackie and she's gonna go through kind of identification and management of anaphylaxis thank you so much so the, uh, the next set of slides that I'm going to go through could actually be taken out and put into a presentation on a variety of different subjects. What I want to really focus on is, let's start with definitions. I'm a stickler for what a word means. So the word anaphylaxis, what it really means is that life-threatening reaction that affects more than one body system. So that just means two body systems. Now, anaphylaxis and anaphylactic shock are terms that are usually used for the same thing, but in my opinion, they're actually not, because shock means that there's a drop in blood pressure and that narrowing of the airways in response to an exposure, particularly of an allergen, and that's what makes it shock. But most people do use these interchangeably. So now let's take a look at our next slide. And you're going to see that 
There we go. Okay, so what you're going to see is this is a, a great slide again, which you have seen in other presentations on a variety of other problems. We're talking today particularly about anaphylaxis as it relates to the COVID vaccine, but you could use this anaphylaxis as it relates to food or venom or latex or medication allergy. And what are those symptoms? Remember, it's got to be a more than one body symptom that's a Affected. So look at the symptoms in the mouth, whether that be itching in the mouth or swelling of the tongue or in the throat where you get itching or closing of the throat, in the heart where you actually get a weak pulse um, or where you get in the chest in particular shortness of breath and coughing. There's a, a large um, Per, uh, perspective of what can be actually in these systems, in your skin. It can be something as as mild as a hive or something as um, all-encompassing as whole body flushing. Uh, stomach can be uh, tremendous vomiting and diarrhea or it can just be cramps. But the point of this is, is think of each one of these as a different body symptom. And then what do you do with this? And as this and every slide after this is going to say to you, you epi, epi, epi. This slide particularly talks about epi everywhere, epi every day, <laughs> epi right away. Most importantly, because these symptoms may start quite mild and then it picks up speed. So what you need to be cognizant of is if you are witnessing more than one body symptom, then you are having anaphylaxis and that that needs to be treated with epinephrine. So on our next slide, talks about um, epi first and epi fast. Only medication proven to Stop allergic. Hence, it is first treat. One could actually say it's the first line, second line, and third one that's proven to stop the life-threatening allergic reaction. And that's why you need to give this as soon as possible. And I want to take a moment to just sort of digress to, again, other cases of anaphylaxis that we often talk about um, with, with our parents in particular. And our parents will say, well, I don't want my kid to get one of these epinephrine treatments that you're seeing the picture of here. I don't want my kid to get one of these needles um, until they really need it. And the point is, you're not going to know when you've hit that tipping point. So have one of these forms ready. And what you can see on this chart is there are branded and generic devices, and you can see actually somewhat which are companions to the other, that, for instance, um, EpiPen and um, the Epi Auto Injector are made by the same company. Um, there is AviQ, which has a talking recording. Synjepi is a relatively new one uh, on the market. And what are you doing when you give these as an auto-injector? Auto-injector means that you, auto, yourself, are giving this. Why are you giving it? Because it needs to be given now. It's not that you bring it with you to the emergency room and have a physician give it to you. You are meant to be giving this quickly and uh, at the signs of anaphylaxis. And what it will do is turn around those symptoms of anaphylactic shock. So it's gonna turn around and increase your heart rate and increase your blood pressure that has dropped. It's gonna relax the muscles in the airway. It's gonna reverse the, the swelling. It's gonna suppress the body's immune system. So it will turn those symptoms around. And notice it will only do this uh, temporarily and sometimes you need to do it again. You need to give a second epinephrine injection because um, it is only temporary that it has been able to turn this around. So epinephrine is the drug, as I keep saying, that reverses anaphylaxis, and that's why it needs to be given as soon as the symptoms uh, appear. Please do not delay on giving this, uh, because where we see the deaths in anaphylaxis are often due to the delay in the use of epinephrine or not using it all, so waiting for that, that perfect moment. The question often comes up about antihistamines or epinephrine, and um, there's really no contest. I mean, it's uh, antihistamines 
don't do the same thing that I just explained that epinephrine does. They don't reverse anaphylaxis. And it's not that, well, let me give the antihistamine first and then see if I need the big guns. It's use that epinephrine auto injector as the first treatment. And it's not that this is going to cause some sort of harm, like, well, I don't want to overdose it or I don't want to use it in cases where it's not required. If you think that it is, it is. Antihistamines are only going to treat those minor symptoms of anaphylaxis like hives. And most importantly, they take about 30 minutes in order to work. And you don't have 30 minutes when you're talking about a life-threatening allergic reaction. So you need to be able to give them and give that epinephrine fast, not without delay, uh, because that, that is where it's meant to be. So with that, I will uh, turn this back over to Tanya. And what you'll see again on her title slide here is that, um, that depiction of anaphylaxis. Uh, and again, I want to just remind people that that is true whether we're talking about that in COVID uh, or, or whether we're talking about that in any other of the allergy states that we as allergists deals with that can cause anaphylaxis. So Tanya, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Rigari, and also Dr. Parikh. Very helpful in kind of giving us the uh, latest update about all the vaccines, as well as about the concern around the allergic reactions and how to treat those allergic reactions. Um, so again, as we conclude today's formal agenda and outline, uh, we want to talk about some of the resources that have been created by Allergy Announcement Network that are free and available for uh, each of you to access. And then we're going to go to your questions and answers. So please go ahead and put your questions in the panel. We do have a lot of questions to get to. We're going to get to as many of those as possible. Um, at, back in March, we did develop our COVID-19 Information Center, and this is where we've collated all of our resources, whether it be COVID-19, Frequently Asked Questions, the mental health of COVID-19, uh, some of the myths and misperceptions, the uh, relationship of asthma and COVID-19. There are many, many different tools here when it comes to allergies, asthma, and in relation to COVID, as well as a lot of great school resources. So please uh, do not hesitate, go ahead and take a look at our, that COVID Information Center where there are so many free downloads and resources uh, for you and the community that you serve as a healthcare provider. So let's go to our next uh, poll question. And it is, have you visited the Allergy Asthma Network Center's COVID-19 Information Center yet? And I'll launch that poll, yes, no, or, but now I plan to. So hopefully most of you on the line have had a chance to check that out over the course of the last few months um, and have found it to be helpful. But uh, certainly we love to see this kind of response from the group that is on the line today. Leave it open for just a moment longer. Now that it looks like we've got about, again, three-fourths, we'll go ahead and close the poll and share the results. So, oops, sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened. The poll disappeared. Hmm, on my end. So I can see it on my end, and it's 30%. Uh, okay, great. So 30% said yes, 22% said no, it just came back. And then 48% said, no, but now I plan to. So we love to see that. Definitely hope that you all have an opportunity to check it out and use those resources readily with your community. Um, so then what are some of the other resources and publications that we've got available? We have our Understanding Anaphylaxis Guide. It's kind of the A to Z 101 guide to all things allergies and anaphylaxis, and it is available for free download or for reordering that you can share in print. Uh, we have our epinephrine treatments poster that you saw earlier with the different types of epinephrine auto injectors that are available on the market today. And it's a guide to all of those different auto injectors, the indications for age and weight and how to use them appropriately. And then we have that anaphylaxis at a glance poster, the signs and symptoms, as well as the recommended steps to take when recognizing anaphylaxis. And so all of those are free resources that you can download on our website or that you can order uh, to have shipped and, and used in your clinic. 
We also have created a couple of videos called Patient Learning Pathways. These are really short to uh, two to three, five minute videos um, that explain anaphylaxis in easy to understand terms. Um, and again, this is relative to all allergies as both Dr. Freak and Dr. Agari mentioned. So these are free and readily available for you to share in the work that you're doing as well as take a look at. We'd love to get your feedback on them. Now let's turn the uh, remainder of our time to your questions. We'll definitely get to as many as possible. And um, as we're doing that, sounds like perhaps, hopefully the poll results are down now. I apologize about that, guys. Um, there was a little glitch on the technology on my side in that. But nonetheless, let's get to your questions because that is where uh, we get the greatest feedback and insight into um, new topics for additional webinars. So let's go to our first question. And it, it, I'll go to Dr. Parikh. It says, I heard seniors have a more robust immunity to COVID-19 if they didn't take their antihistamine on the day they get their vaccination. Is that true? Um, so, you know, we don't have any data with the role of antihistamines um, and vaccination, you know, just from a purely immune standpoint, you know, uh, antihistamine shouldn't really have any effect on the immunity of COVID-19 vaccine, which is, you know, your body making IgG antibodies or your body's T cells um, getting ready to fight COVID-19. So there, there shouldn't be anything where an antihistamine would suppress it. But um, other medicines like steroids can sometimes suppress vaccine responses, but that's oral steroids. So your inhalers are safe, your nasal sprays are completely safe. So, but again, you know, we're still recommending, even if you are one of those people that needs these, that medication chronically, that you take it because uh, outside of that, you're probably also uh, at higher risk of getting sick if you need an immune suppressive medication. So our next question comes from Gail, and I think Dr. Agari, it would be great for you. Are there other medical conditions that may exclude someone from actually getting the COVID vaccine beyond the allergy to those specific conditions? Uh, the one that comes to mind first on that is, I think, some of what we talked about, especially when Dr. Parikh was, was presenting what's come down as an allergic reaction. And, and that's where my mind goes when somebody asks that question, is um, what are things that are not truly allergic uh, reactions, but that they are concerns that happen after you take a vaccine that could be adverse? Um, reactions. And the number one uh, disease that comes to mind is called Guillain-Barre. And um, this is a immune response that people have had to other vaccinations, sometimes to even other infections. And that group was not actually studied in this particular vaccine uh, trial. However, the way that this vaccine is um, devised what it's made of because it is an mRNA vaccine. The thoughts are that you're not going to have the same type of immunological reaction that you could have with a more traditional vaccine that actually introduces uh, the, the, the virus as an infection or as an infectious vector. Um, so that's a long way of saying the first thing I think of is Guillain-Barre as, as a reason to be concerned and while there's not a definitive answer to that, um, my suggestion would be that people go ahead and get it. Great. Okay. So, Dr. Freak, this comes from Vanessa, and she says, I have a life-threatening peanut and pea allergy. Can I get the vaccine? People who have had reactions, what type of other allergies have they had? Do we have that data on the 21 cases? Right. So, you know, it's it's kind of a mixed bag. Some of the people did have a history of previous allergic reactions or food allergies, but interestingly, uh, many did not. Many had no allergic history. So uh, currently there isn't any strong association with one specific type of allergy that predisposes anyone. Uh, I know the NIH is designing a study to look into it uh, further, but as of now with peanut or pea allergies, you shouldn't feel um, 
afraid or hesitant to receive the vaccine. As long as you're not allergic, you know, to polyethylene glycol or polysorbate, um, I would go forward with the vaccination and just take those extra precautions of, you know, waiting 30 minutes after, bring your EpiPen, do it in a medical facility. Right. So this next question is, is wonderful and I appreciate Tiffany asking it. She says, if a person has tested positive for COVID-19, is it possible to become infected with COVID-19 variants within that 90 day post-infection window? Can Dr. you say Dr. that again? Yeah, just, just I wanna yes. make sure I've got the timeline correct. So a person tested positive they, they were COVID positive, COVID-19 positive. And the, is it possible for them to become infected with COVID-19 variants within that 90-day post-infection window? Or do we have the data? So, and, and the, the short answer is we don't have the data because if you, the, those variants are all new um, and, and, and more and more variants I heard there's the new variant, and then there's the new new variant. Um, so, so there are newer and newer ones coming. Um, but overall, um, it is unusual to see reinfection. And where this becomes, I think, more important, especially in a conversation about vaccination, is do people that have already been have been infected, do they need to be uh, vaccinated? How long are their uh, abilities to have it? bodies. So parking off of that kind of data and just the data of how common is it to get reinfected uh, from we know thus far the variants are um, covered by the vaccines. We believe at least the new variant, um, the new new variant is very new and, um, and there hasn't been enough um, uh, case reports even to, to report on that. Uh, so, Dr. Creek, the next question comes from Cheryl, and I think it's most appropriate to you. She said, what is your recommendation as to how long you should wait to get the vaccine if you've actually had COVID-19? And she said she's certainly aware of the 90-day or in recent research sort of six-month immunity window that is playing. But what's your recommendation on getting the vaccine even after you've had COVID-19? Right. So, you know, the current recommendation even um, by the CDC is that to wait until you're feeling um, back to your normal self. So you've recovered from COVID-19 completely. You know, um, I know in the studies, as you had said, it was a 90 day window, but that's not what we're recommending in real life. Now, the only caveat to that is if you got sick and they, you were treated with one of these monoclonal antibody treatments, then actually um, it is being recommended to wait 90 days because the thought is that these monoclonal antibodies may interfere with the vaccine itself. So, but otherwise, once you're feeling better, um, you should go ahead and get the vaccine. And the only other thing I'll just, if I can just uh, tag one thing onto that. When I was vaccinated, um, I also asked the question of, had I had another vaccination to anything else in the recent past? And I think people do need to be aware of that. Let's say you got a flu shot or you got a pneumococcal vaccine. Um, is just to give your, your body a break is how much are you asking your immune system to pick up on? Uh, that that's something that I think people should be aware of. So um, this is a really timely question from Michael in California, who asked if you could comment on the withdrawal of the 300,000 Moderna doses uh, that were withdrawn due to adverse events yesterday. And uh, I'll, I'll go to you, Dr. Freak. Are you aware of that scenario and, and the decision to do so? And do you have any insight as to why that may be? Right, right. So what uh, I know of the situation was that there were 10 uh, reactions out of that lot of 330,000 doses um, and the overwhelming majority of people who received from that lot were fine. But because there were 10 from one specific batch, it triggered an investigation, which is the right move uh, in, with any medication. So this is very routine. Anytime you see multiple um, incidences happening from a uh, same batch, that batch has to be investigated just to see if there's a contaminant or why 
you know, if there's another reason, you know, why there's so many more from that one particular either batch or site or what have you. So it's all per normal protocol. And again, I wouldn't find it to be a cause for concern or alarm or stop anyone from receiving the vaccine. And to clarify, it was not 10 cases of anaphylaxis, it was 10 adverse reactions. In the correct. Lot. Yes, correct. So the next question comes from Nikki, and Nikki says, does taking Tylenol after the vaccine make it less likely to produce an immune response? And for that, I would say uh, no, the same way that Dr. Parikh was saying in terms of people taking uh, antihistamines, um, uh, Motrin, um, and that the one that we would be concerned about is oral, oral corticosteroids um, could affect that. So this is, I, I really appreciate this next question because it comes from Stephanie who shares her own personal experience. She says, I experienced tachycardia on day two after receiving the Moderna vaccine. It resolved on day three, but have you seen this in your experience, Dr. Freak? And then she also was advised to take Benadryl before shot two. Is that what you would have recommended or is that advice? Right. You know, so it's funny. I, we've been hearing a lot of cases of tachycardia and palpitations, um, not just after Moderna, but Pfizer as well. Um, and, and from what we're making of it is that this is not an allergic reaction. Again, this could all be a normal immune response, you know, um, because for most people, it's um, not long lasting. It's, it's not dangerous. So again, you should proceed definitely with those two. As for the Benadryl, again, because it doesn't seem like an allergic reaction, the Benadryl may or may not make a difference, but you know, there's no real harm in taking the Benadryl. So if, if that was recommended and, and you feel better doing so, that, that's okay. But you know, after vaccines, some things that are supposed to happen as your immune system kind of revs up, it's something called reactogenicity. So those fevers, those chills, the fatigue, those are actually a good sign. Um, that the vaccine is working. And my thoughts are that, you know, this tachycardia and palpitations may be um, related to that. So there's certain immune cells that kind of are waking up, the cytokines especially um, come out first. So that it may all just be part of the uh, expected immune response from the vaccine itself. But we have, yes, we have been hearing about the tachycardia and palpitations from both. And just to partner on and piggyback to that is along those lines of that we know you're going to have these reactive immunogenic responses. And that is why even from the pediatric world, we oftentimes would have people before they get any sort of a vaccine, they do take the Tylenol, they do take the Motrin. And what I wonder in this particular case is would it be helpful to take the antihistamine simply as a sedative? because you'd be chillaxed and if, if right. that helped you in terms of your tachycardia. And again, they have no um, effect on your immune response. And so whatever helps get you through, warm bottle of milk, you know, that's fine. All right, thank you both so much. So unfortunately we are out of time today. I know we didn't get to all the questions, but we will continue to read through them and provide those answers on our uh, COVID-19 Information Center, as well as in upcoming webinars. Um, I do just want to remind you that here in the last few minutes, you can get your certificate of attendance. And we sincerely thank you for listening as we've looked at COVID-19 and how to get creative in your care at this time. And certainly the updates on the latest around vaccine and allergic reaction. Please consider joining us for our next webinar in our COVID-19 webinar series, when we'll look at COVID-19 long haul consequences. And this webinar will be on Thursday, February 4th at 4 p.m. Eastern. And you can all, as always, register on our webpage, uh, webinar site uh, on the news section of our webpage. At this time, uh, if you're able to stay on the line, we'd love to have you uh, watch a short video message that's actually just recently been produced by CDC. It explains a lot about the COVID-19 vaccines in language that's very easy to understand and accessible from our nation's leading health leaders. Uh, as we conclude, we'll go ahead and watch the video. And again, I just wanna thank you all for joining on behalf of the network and our staff. So let's play that video. And again, thank you for your attendance today. My primary message to healthcare professionals is please get vaccinated. It's important to protect yourselves, to protect your family, but as important symbolically. 
as healthcare providers to show confidence in the vaccine so that other people in this country follow suit and get vaccinated. COVID-19 vaccines are new and questions from patients should be expected. I think it's very important for providers to tell their Latino patients how important getting that vaccine is going to be to their families. The families that have essential workers that have to go to work, students that need to go to school, and we're not going to be able to do that without all doing our part and getting the vaccine is so important. I know you heard about the warp speed. The warp speed, you all, did not mean that steps were skipped. Warp speed actually meant, in my opinion, that we finally use the resources that we have in the public and the private sector to do something in lightning time that is gonna have a significant impact on our communities and on the patients that we care for every day. To review answers to common patient questions, please search Answering Patients' Questions on cdc.gov. There are three kinds of COVID-19 vaccines being developed by Operation Warp Speed. First, we have an mRNA vaccine. The mRNA is combined with tiny lipid particles. We have replication and competent virus vectors and protein subunit combined with oil and water adjuvants. None of these vaccines transmit COVID-19 since they only express a protein from the virus that allows your body's immune system to generate antibodies. Because vaccines are given to millions of healthy people to prevent serious diseases, they're held to very high safety standards. Both the FDA and the CDC have to ensure the safety and efficacy of the vaccines before they are recommended for use in the United States. COVID-19 vaccines are undergoing a rigorous development process that includes vaccinating tens of thousands of people who participate in the study to generate the needed clinical data. At the same time, uh, when the clinical trials are underway, the manufacturers, of course, have to develop processes to ensure that they can consistently manufacture large quantities of the vaccine. Once the FDA has authorized the vaccine, then the CDC also has an independent advisory committee that reviews the data before advising the CDC on recommending the vaccine for use among the general public. It's worth noting that the clinical studies to establish the safety and efficacy of the COVID-19 vaccines were as big and thorough as recent studies for other licensed vaccines like for shingles. We will have more information on the side effects from the vaccines when the findings from the clinical trials become available. We have seen no trends of serious side effects. Short-term side effects that were observed in the leading COVID-19 vaccine trials included injection site pain and redness, fatigue, muscle aches and pains, joint pain, headache. When one develops the short term symptoms after receiving the vaccine, that in fact is a sign that the vaccine is working and that your body is marshalling its defense network. It's actually not possible to get COVID-19 from any of these vaccines because they are not using live virus. I think it's important that we look at this holistically. So the vaccine is important and it's a protective measure. Wearing a mask is important also. Physical distancing of six feet is important. Washing one's hands for 20 seconds is important. I'm very optimistic about what the ultimate impact of these vaccines will be. One, it will be important for the safety and the health of individual people. But when you get a certain percentage of the population vaccinated, we can create an umbrella of herd immunity 
literally over the entire country. That will take several months to occur, but I feel confident that if we get a substantial proportion of the population vaccinated, that we can actually end this epidemic as we know it in this country. For guidance and tools, please visit www.cdc.gov and search Toolkit for Healthcare Providers. Again, on behalf of the network and our team, we want to thank you for your participation today. We wish you all continued health and well-being, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, and have a great day.